This is John Genke. Welcome to Live from the Lab. Uh, during this series, we explore different tech that Brooker has developed in order to help scientists discover things around the world, in the world around us. Today, I'm joined by Nick Redesny. Hi, John. And our topic is perfect powder data automatically. So, Nick, I think that's a pretty packed question there. Maybe if we break it up. <laughs> it sure is, yeah. yeah. So, uh, first of all, what's powder diffraction? Yeah, so when we think about powder diffraction, typically we're thinking about a polycrystalline material that has uh, randomly oriented crystallites in it. And it might be a powder, a loose powder, or it also could be a solid that has similar, similar characteristics. So by polycrystalline, you mean it's made up of a lot of little? Right, bits? yeah, multiple crystals. It's not just one single crystal, but lots of little tiny crystals. So it's kind of like sand on a beach. Sand on a beach, exactly. Okay. And uh, now if we take that the other step, what would you call perfect? powder data. Yeah, so uh, typically when we think about powder data, we talk about a Bragg-Brentano geometry that has fixed divergent slits, maybe a fixed air scatter screen, and a fixed detector opening. Uh, for perfect powder data, uh, if we're doing a long scan range, maybe we want to add some motors to those optics um, and have adjustable slits that open and close as we're scanning, or an air scatter screen that might move up and down. I mean, doesn't the fixed pieces work, though? I mean, that's kind of what we've had for 100 years. Yeah, the fixed pieces do. Uh, they work just fine. Um, but there are some instances where having these motorized uh, slits can greatly improve your data quality. So um, in terms of using a fixed slit, what are some of the limitations in that? Right. So with the fixed slit, um, one of the limitations is your footprint, your beam footprint changes on the size of your sample. Um, so if you're at really low angle, of course, the beam is going to get really wide. If you go up to higher angles, your beam gets a lot smaller on the sample. And so you kind of have to pick a compromise then. Right. You have to usually pick a beam size that reduces the amount of beam spillover at low angle. Mm -hmm. So you really optimize for low angle, but not necessarily for high angle. And you just rely on your experience in terms of that? Uh, yep. There are some little calculations yeah. that you might do, and you kind of know what your starting angle and what your slit size should be for a particular sample. And then what about this air scatter shield? I know in the very classic systems, they weren't necessarily around, but as we have with these 1D detectors, we're starting to see them more often. Right, so with the 0D detector, we had these uh, receiving slits on the detector side that did a really good job of eliminating any air scatter. Okay. But now with these 1D detectors, we have a much larger detector opening, um, and so air scatter is uh, more of a problem. And that's just the x-rays hitting that air and then kind of shooting in all directions? Right, it's just the air inside the enclosure mm -hmm. scattering the x-ray beam. Okay. So, and, and that's actually one of the benefits of x-ray diffraction, right, is that we can do it in the air. It's not like an electron technique. Right, exactly. Yep. Um, so then we have the air scatter shield, and what's, what's the downside to using the fixed one? Uh, so the fixed one, uh, just like with your slits, if you're at lower angles, you would mm -hmm. want it to be really, really close to your sample. At higher angles, you need it to be further away. And if you kept it low angle for the higher angles? So if you kept it at a low position yep. or a high angle, what would happen? So if your beam is really low and you're scanning mm -hmm. at a high angle, uh, the x-ray beam will actually hit that air scatter screen and you'll start to lose intensity because you're cropping the x-ray beam. Ah, okay. So we'd actually see a fall down of intensity. Exactly. Yep. Um, and then on the detector side of things, you know, classically, I know we'd use these 0D detectors, point detector with a very small aperture in front of it. Um, now we have 1D detectors. Yep, so right now we have 1D detectors mm -hmm. that have uh, a bunch of little strip readouts on the silicon chip. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows us to, to collect multiple data points uh, at a time. So it really speeds up data collection. So it speeds up data collection yeah. uh, greatly. If you have uh, 192 data points counting simultaneously, it's much faster than counting one data point at a time. So do you lose resolution though? Uh, no, so the size of those strips on our, on our lynx eye detectors are 75 microns compared to a maybe 150 micron receiving slit that you could use on a 0D detector. So um, in terms of that strip size, is that like 75 microns kind of sounds like a random number? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like we just kind of threw, threw a number out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it's actually uh, uh, probably the best middle ground between having good resolution and limiting something called charge sharing. Charge sharing? So. Yeah, what's, so that's what's this do? So charge sharing is when a photon hits that silicon uh, detector, yeah. and maybe you have multiple strips counting that photon. Um, so you're sh you're sharing that charge generated on the detector. Phase. Okay, and so then you can't count the energy as well. Right, exactly. Uh -huh. You actually start to lose some counts if you have really uh, severe charge sharing. Okay, and um, so then all three of these parts would work together. You would use your expertise, so so many many years of experience mm -hmm. uh, with diffraction to be able to set these just right and then get the right data for that sample. Yeah, you would think that it takes a, an expert to do something like this. Yeah. 
Um, but all of these calculations are done in our software. So you really only need to know a couple parameters to get this really excellent powder data. So that's for the new stuff. But for the classic stuff, you'd kind of uh, have to rely on that expertise, know the, know the material, what angle you're going to Having the expertise then. certainly helps, yeah. So like Nick was alluding to, what we have is a new technology. Uh, we call this dynamic beam optimization. And DBO is an automatic version uh, of this. We have a little video to explain some of those parts, and we're going to switch over to that now. Dynamic beam optimization. Perfect powder data automatically. Whether the samples that you work with come from a hole in the ground or a reactor in the lab, the chemical and physical properties are determined by their atomic structure. For example, the swelling and chemical reactivity of clay minerals is linked to both large and small scale features of the clay species. On the other end of the spectrum, functional effects of nanomaterials are determined by both interatomic and intermolecular length scales. The ideal XRD measurement is composed of peaks at specific angles with specific relative intensities. Local peaks reveal larger scale properties of the material, while high angle peaks expose small scale properties. Once you introduce real world factors into your measurement, such as air scatter, signal from the sample holder, and inaccuracies in peak intensities due to beam overflow, the problems with your analysis become quite apparent. The traditional solution was to take multiple measurements using a small beam at low angles and a larger beam at higher angles and then stitch them together. With dynamic beam optimization, all three technologies, the motorized divergence slit, motorized air scatter shield, and variable detector opening converge, resulting in perfect powder data automatically. All right, so um, welcome back here to the studio. So we're gonna look at a few of these components now. Um, so what we have here, what would this be, Nick? So that is our motorized air scatter screen, or okay. what we call the mass for short. Mm -hmm. um, and what this is, there's a motor up here in, in this part, um, and that controls the height of this knife edge above your sample. And what's this knob for? That's to mount the knife edge to the goniometer. Oh, okay, so it looks like you can, kind of, if you want to mount it, you just pop it up there. And exactly, it only it takes on. a couple seconds to mount and dismount it. And then here we have our uh, Linksi detector. Now, this is called the Linksi XET. So what's special about this one? So this Linksi XET detector has really excellent energy resolution. Um, the energy resolution is so good that you can actually uh, electronically filter out K-beta mm -hmm. radiation, as well as all of the fluorescence you might see from your sample. So typically, um, for K-beta, we'd have to stick some sort of like a... Uh, filtering here. Right, like yeah. Nickel. Yep, for copper x-rays, it would be a nickel filter. Um, and that would absorb the K-beta radiation. But it also absorbs some alpha, right? It does. It, uh, anytime you have a nickel filter or a K-beta filter, it will attenuate your K-alpha beam a little bit. And that's quite significant. It's like a factor of two almost, right? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a, a pretty dramatic yeah. drop you'll see. And the other thing I, I think I've seen before is when you put that filter in, sometimes you get these little like bumps in your data. Right, so that's called an absorption edge. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see that absorption edge. It looks like a little drop right between your K alpha and your K beta radiation. So this, uh, this technology, this is something new? Something that Bruker This is something that, that Bruker has had for years. Um, really? Yep. So, and that's available just in our advanced or most advanced tools? Or? That's available on all of our XRD systems. Oh, really? Even the benchtop? Even the benchtop. Okay. So, um, Linksci XE is, uh, XET definitely sounds like it's a, it's a great thing to have in your system for doing things automatically, because then you don't have to worry about changing out filters. And things like that. Right, exactly. You're always in this, what we call high-resolution mode, um, which will automatically filter out that K-beta, the fluorescence, um, and of course, give you really good signal to background. So I guess one more question before we head over to the lab. You mentioned fluorescence. Um, where does that come from? Yeah, so it, if you have uh, certain elements in your mm -hmm. sample, um, for copper x-rays, iron is the main culprit. Uh, the copper x-rays actually excite that iron in your sample and cause it to fluoresce. And those fluorescing x-rays uh, also will go and hit your detector. So fluorescing means that the sample is actually glowing with a, a different energy. Right? <laughs> right, with a different x-ray energy. Okay, and then that gets detected by the detector, and then you would typically get elevated background. Right, so your background, if your sample is fluorescing, will be elevated, and it might look a little bit noisier, too. Okay. 
So with that, I think what we're going to do is see all of these components, uh, the, the, the detector, we're going to see the mass and the variable slit. We're going to see that in action over at the lab. So we'll head on over there and then catch up with you when we get there. Let's check it out. So um, we're here in the D8 Advanced Lab, or our powder diffraction lab, uh, and this instrument is a... So this is a D8 Advance. Okay. This is our, uh, really the flagship uh, floor model uh, x-ray diffractometer that we have. Okay, so um, this looks like it has a really big door on it. When we looked at the bench top, I remember it kind of... Yep, it's a little bit smaller. smaller. So you can see the door is quite large, so easy, okay. easily access what's inside. Yep. Um, and if we look at the components, we'll see all the same ones that we saw uh, in the studio. So on our primary side here, of course, we have our tube. And then right in front of that, we have our motorized slits. So this is what one of the components we'll be using for DBO. Right over our sample, of course, you can see our mass, our motorized air scatter screen. So as we're scanning, this screen will automatically move up and down. And then on the secondary side, we see our Linksci XET detector. And what would that, uh, where's the sample at? The so the sample is right here in the middle. Okay. You can see I can unload it. So we'd call that a powder because yeah. it's actually a powder that you packed in? Or? Yep, this is a loose powder that we packed into the sample holder, into the sample cavity, and smoothed it over. Now, is that, a, is that that typical nickel filter in front of your detector, or...? Nope, so all we have right now in front of our detector is a solar slit. So that looks like it's just a bunch of copper plates then? Yep, it's a bunch of copper plates that limit the axial divergence uh, of our diffracted beam. Okay, and that gives you a little bit better resolution. It does, yeah. Okay. Exactly. So now, I also noticed on the primary side that there was two little stickers on the enclosure. Yep. Of that box. So on this uh, primary optic, we have two stickers because we have two different beam paths. So we have our motorized slit, and then the second one here, we could, if we want, we could switch to a Goebel mirror, uh, which will give us a parallel beam. Okay. And so now you're saying that all of these components, though, we can control those through the software. Right, because they all have motors attached to them, we can control the opening and uh, you know switch back and forth to a parallel beam all in the software. So maybe we'll take a little bit of a uh, look at that and uh, how you would actually set up one of these dynamic beam optimization scans. Yeah, so let's take a look at the software and we'll set up one of these scans. Okay, so right now uh, the last scan that we did was a traditional Bragg-Brentano geometry fixed slit scan. So what we'll do now is we'll set up just real quick a DBO scan. Okay. So we'll set our air scatter, right? That's our mass. We'll set that to automatic. So I don't have to tell it like five millimeters or physically put it somewhere? Nope. So based on the size of your divergence slit and the two theta angle that you're measuring, the height of that air scatter screen will automatically move to where it needs to be so it doesn't crop the beam. Okay. All right. We'll set our primary optic here to fixed sample illumination. So all we need to input here is the size of our sample. So in this case, we're going to put in 15 millimeters. Now, would that be the total diameter of the sample, or do we go a little smaller so we don't get overspill? Yeah, so as we're looking at the sample, this would be the uh, left to right dimension uh, if we're looking at it inside the enclosure. And okay. we do want to set this so uh, it doesn't spill over and hit the sample holder. Now, do we have to somehow tell the mass then that we've used the fixed sample illumination versus the static slit? Nope, it's in the software. It already knows that. Okay, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is sounding pretty automatic so far. Um, so what's the next step then? So we have the first two components here, right? We have our mass and we yep. have our primary optic. The next one is we're going to select our scan type at the bottom here to be a couple two theta VDO, and that stands for variable detector opening. Okay. So as we start at low angle, our detector will be a little bit more closed down, and as it scans up to higher angles, we'll open up that detector a little bit more and more. Okay. Okay, so now we're all ready. We'll hit now, this sample I know is some sort of a Martian lunar simulant or <laughs> Martian simulant. Yeah, so this particular sample uh, is actually from the Reynolds Cup, uh, yeah. and it's uh, Reynolds Cup sample number 10-3, and that is a uh, Martian simulant. So this sample was put yeah. together to simulate a Martian soil. So it has both low angle and high angle peaks in it, right? Yeah, exactly. There's a few clay minerals in here, which we'll see at low angle. And uh, as we get up to higher angle, there's also a lot of amorphous content that we'll see as well. And you would typically have to measure this in two regions, a low angle and then a high angle. 
right. if you were using fixed setups, right? Exactly. Okay. So with, with uh, DBO, we're able to kind of streamline that process and just collect one scan all at once. So now this uh, DBO concept, this is available only on the D8 Advance, or are there other instruments? Uh, so it's available on both the D8 Advance and also the D8 Endeavor, which we have over here in the corner. So, okay, so this instrument now, this actually looks like kind of the XRF that I've seen from Brooker. I don't see that goniometer, the, the diffractometer part of it. Yeah, it is in here. It might look a lot like an XRF system, but it has this bit right here on the back. And this is where the goniometer is. Ah, okay, so it's back here in this uh, radiation enclosure area? Yep, so it's inside of this enclosure to uh, keep it safe from any uh, pollutants that might be in the air. Now, the, it looks pretty compact in there, so, and I'm not seeing the same pieces. Right, so it is the same goniometer, um, but some of the items you see on the track might look a little different. So we have the same x-ray tube. Um, right in front of that, we have our motorized primary slits. So this is one of the components we need for DBO. Right above our sample stage, right here, we have our motorized air scatter screen. Right, this is our mass. And then over on the secondary side, we see the same detector, that Linksci XCT. Okay, so we can have all of that tech for DBO into this small enclosure. Now, what's the benefit, though, of having this hidden behind the, the panel? Yeah, so one of the benefits is it keeps all of the sensitive parts of the instrument uh, protected. Oftentimes, you see these D8 endeavors in uh, you know, pretty harsh environments, things like cement plants or mining facility uh, in an industrial setting. Where you don't really want uh, that dust getting in, or even the dirty fingerprints. Right, exactly. Operators. Or maybe you don't want some of your operators getting in there either. Uh, that's true. <laughs> um, so we close that up, and then now in front of it, it looks like there's quite a robust sample loader here. Yeah, if we take a look inside, uh, of course you can load up multiple samples here. Mm -hmm. uh, the Endeavor can actually hold up to 66 different samples at a time. Oh, wow. And what if, what if I had an automation set up, though? Yeah, so there's a couple tunnels here on the left and right side where they can be set up with conveyor belts, and you can automate samples coming in and out of the instrument and set up the measurement to uh, communicate with the limb system as well. Okay. Now, in terms of sample holders, are these kind of the standard ones that everybody uh, uses? Yeah, they sure are. These are the same holders um, that we use on the advanced, but they're also industry standard size, uh, 51.5 millimeters. Okay. So now, if we maybe take a look back at some of this data that we've been collecting... So look, um, one thing I'm noticing that's quite different than the classic data would be, I would expect that I would see kind of the, the intensity staying higher and then the background getting lower. And I know this is probably some sort of a effect of some signal from the sample, but that overall increase of background, what's that coming from? Right, so when you're doing one of these DBO scans, because as we're scanning up to higher two theta angles, our slit is opening more and more, we're allowing more and more photons to hit the sample. So more photons, of course, mean, will mean more background. So would you call this uh, like a, a bad thing that we need to correct, or? Uh, it's not a bad thing, certainly not a bad thing. The more photons you get to your sample at higher angles, that will improve your signal to noise ratio, which is always good. So it's more something that we, uh, we can do a transformation. Right, okay. um, yeah, because uh, you know, it's just a geometric effect. Um, we can convert it in the software using a couple equations. Okay, so do we have that capability in EVA? Yeah, so diffract.eva can certainly convert. Um, so here I've collected a fixed slit scan, which would be a traditional Bragg-Brentano okay. uh, scan, and also a dynamic beam optimization scan. All right, and then here I can definitely see now that we have that nice flat background all the way over that entire range. Right, exactly. Yeah. So we see this has been converted into uh, our fixed slit mode. So you can see the background yep. is nice and flat, and it also makes it a bit easier to see that amorphous uh, hump uh, in this sample. It, with the fixed slits, it's a little bit harder to tell that that amorphous hump is there. Yeah, I, I really don't know how scientifically you could claim that there was anything there. I mean, right. there's other features too that are just as large, it seems. Right, if you background subtract, uh, it's possible that you might actually get rid of that amorphous. So now I'm assuming that the red data has been collected much longer than the black data? Uh, no, so these are both six minute scans. Really? Yep, so identical scan times. I'm just really amazed at how this, uh, the noise, especially at the higher angles, it's much lower in that red data. It is, and that's because we have more x-rays uh, hitting the sample out there at those higher angles. Wow, and it really matters there, because now I can start to see these little tiny peaks here, whereas here, I mean, signal to noise there is like less than one. Almost. Right, it really brings out some of those features that you can see um, at the high angles. Yeah. Um, the other advantage, too, is, uh, you know, you still have decent resolution when you get out to those higher angles as well. 
So it really does seem that DBO can collect what I would call perfect counter data automatically. It certainly can. Yeah. So Nick, I, does this mean you're out of a job? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to head right on back to the lab, uh, to the studio, and we're going to answer some questions. All right, so here we are. We're back in the studio, uh, and we've got quite a few questions that have come in. So I think we kind of hit a hot topic here. So the first question is from Vitali, and that is, how do you choose? Oh, how do you choose the correct exposure time and two theta step or increment? Yeah, so we have some uh, tip general rules uh, that we use for this. Um, the exposure time, of course, this is going to have an effect on your signal to noise ratio. Um, so Really, whatever is required for your analysis, you would adjust your uh, exposure time. Um, and then for the step size and increment, um, it really depends on the resolution of the peaks that you're seeing. Um, of course, for sharper peaks that are high resolution, you would need to use a smaller step size. Mm -hmm. And then for, of course, for wider peaks, you would use a larger step size. So general rule of thumb, what are we looking for? So our general rule of thumb is uh, you want to have about five to seven data points above the full width half max of your peak. OK. And then in terms of intensity, that signal to noise factor, um, well, first of all, what is signal to noise? We hear that a lot. We do, yeah. So signal to noise, signal would be the height of your peak, for uh -huh. example, and the noise would be the variation that you see in the background. Okay, so what are we looking for there to be able to positively say this peak is present? Yeah, so for limits of detection, we typically want to see a signal to noise ratio of three. We want our peak to be three times in the noise. Okay, so we'd be looking for a factor of three for that, and then five peak points above the full width at half. Exactly, yep. So the next question is from... Uh, Vicent, and how close is the tip of the scatter screen to the sample surface at low angles? Can the knife contribute to x-ray data? Ah, that's a very good question. So, of course, if you're starting at a really low angle, that knife might get, you know, just a couple hundred microns away from the sample. It will get very, very close. Um, and the second part, can the knife contribute to the data? Uh, for that, we say no, because you want to have that knife edge just barely above uh, the x-ray beam. It'll yeah. be really close, but not touching the beam. Definitely don't want it touching. I remember once I uh, went in to uh, uh, visit one of our customers, and they were, they were saying, well, my data, it's, it's not looking as good as what we expected it to be or what we're used to with XRD. And I said, OK, well, why don't you show me how you prep the sample and then show how, how you, you run it. And it was very interesting because they took that sample and they just mount, put a big old mound on top <laughs> of it. And then they placed the sample into the machine, put the air scatter shield on, and then started rotating it. And, ah. and then they ran the scan. And I said, well, so that's very interesting. You know, what, what is, what's the idea here? And they said, well, we're using your automatic sample smoothing device. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, I mean, the sample looked pretty smooth. Uh, but that air scatter shield should not be touching the sample. Right. If the air scatter yeah. shield touches that sample, um, you probably won't be getting very much intensity getting through to your detector. Yeah, yeah and that's exactly what we were seeing. So the next question is uh, from Z Heng Yu. And the question there is, how does beam size affect your data, like the shape of the beam? Uh, and then a follow-up, how does this affect the diffraction peaks? Yeah, so good question. Uh, of course, the size of the slit that you use has an effect on the resolution of the XRD peak that you'll see. Um, you know, Generally, with most XRD optics, the larger the slit, the wider the peak. Um, so as we scan up to higher angles with this DBO, we are opening our slit to be a little bit larger, so your peaks will get just a little bit wider. Yeah, and one thing to note too, in XRD, um, it's, it's a parafocusing geometry, they say, and parafocusing comes from the idea that you have two focusing circles involved. So one focusing circle has the two, the detector, and then the sample on it. Right, yep. Uh, and and in that instance, if you were to imagine tracing that out, you would see that the ideal sample should actually be slightly curved, right? And that curve change is a function of angle. And unfortunately, that's not the case, right? Right. So <laughs> the wider the beam, that's why you get a little bit wider peak. It's just from this. Uh, right. It's something called flat specimen error. 
So, uh, but you generally only see that in the most, most, most sharp people. Right. Tonight. Yeah, for most samples, it's yeah. you don't really notice it too much. Uh, next question is from Francisco, and we always use cobalt radiation for geological samples. Does the Linksci XCT work with cobalt? It, it sure does. Yeah, the, the Linksci XCT has a silicon uh, sensor on it, mm -hmm. and it works for uh, radiations from silver all the way up to chrome. Really? So, okay. Yeah, so it works really well for range. cobalt. So applications like uh, PDF would yeah. be able to do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see here. The next question then. So from Xiao, do you have every component? Do you have to have every component to do this? Ah, to do DBO, I'm guessing. Um, and the answer is no. Um, to do DBO, you know, we talk about DBO as having those three components, um, but you can use those components individually. So if you only have a motorized slip, for example, uh, you can do a fixed sample illumination scan. Uh, you know, if you only have a mass. Uh, you can certainly use just the mask with fixed slits and a fixed detector opening. So you don't have to have all of the components mm -hmm. to do DBO. Um, you can use just certain ones. I would say to me, the magical part, though, if I was to have anything, it would probably be that mask. I agree. In terms of DBO. Of course, Linksci XCT, that's generally useful. For <laughs> right. I mean, the intensity gain there, just because you don't have nickel filter is what? Uh, you get about twice the intensity without that nickel filter. Yeah, none of the defects. So. That's definitely a kind of class of its own. But yeah. I would say the mass is definitely. The mass is really what helps you get that, those really long scan range. If you wanted yeah. to do a scan from three degrees up to 100 degrees in, in one go, uh, the mass is really what makes that happen. Yeah. So uh, next question, actually kind of a follow-up from Xiao. Since these are new components, are they only available on new systems, or could I add these to an existing? Yeah. So of course, if you have a, a D8 advanced DaVinci system, um, you could certainly add them to your existing system. Yeah, and I think something I'd point out there, too, is that they're not necessarily all new. Mm -hmm. Right. These components have been around for, uh, for quite a while. So, um, and DBO has been around for uh, quite a few years as well. Yeah, like the variable slit, we've seen that for, I mean, that was in our <laughs> yeah, old platform, so it would probably be 20 years. Uh, the mass, on the other hand, that one, I think only... That one's only been around for, what, maybe, I don't know, four or five years? Yeah, something like that. And then the Linksci XCT... That's been, also about, I think, about four or five yeah, years as well. Four or five years. So, um, the magic though about DBO, that software implementation, that's only been out for about two years. Yeah, that sounds about right. Right, and that's what really uh, makes this easy to use. Is all of these calculations are done in the software. You don't have to get out pen and paper or do any uh, make Excel spreadsheets to figure out what size slit you need. Um, or how high that air scatter screen needs to be. It's yeah. all calculated by the software. It was kind of looking at some specific people. Like, uh, I know for clay analysis, mm -hmm. this is a really, really uh, big breakthrough. It really is. Because um, oftentimes, uh, geological scans, if we're looking at clay minerals and uh, you know just regular minerals, you need to scan all the way from 3 degrees up to maybe 70 or 80. And that's tough to do with just one air scatter screen setting. Because you get those like clay sheet spacings at the low angle. And then at the same time, you get the geological info at the high. Right, right. exactly. OK. Uh, so last question is from uh, Jacqueline. And that question is, I saw something about 0D, 1D, and 2D with a link side. What does that mean? Yeah, so good question. So of course, 0D, uh, we mentioned earlier, that's when you're collecting one data point at a time. Um, 1D is when you're using strips on your detector. So you might, with the link side, be counting 192 data points at a time. But 2D is uh, a little bit different. 2D is where you actually would turn your detector 90 degrees, um, and you would actually collect a whole arc maybe on your Debye rings, mm -hmm. um, which you can all do with this Linksci XCT. Okay. Um, and one of the really great things about doing it with the XCT is uh, you still have that energy discrimination. Um, so you can collect uh, really great 2D data while still filtering out all of your beta and your fluorescence. Yeah, with the pixelated detectors, you start to get a lot of that charge sharing, which you know, we can still do very good uh, on things like the Iger, uh, but you really need to go to the strip size to get that um, that perfect energy discrimination. Right, exactly. Um, and one, one other thing I'd point out is 2D, uh, there is also a new method out called uh, Bragg 2D, and that's where we, we don't even have to turn the detector. You use it in the same uh, bragg Brentano setup, you use a full line beam, and you can get the little spottiness of the lines and to see if you have a crystallite size issue or sample prep issue. So if you're interested in learning more about that, there's um, some info on YouTube and on the other channels on Bragg 2D. So uh, with that, it, 
we've run out of time. If you do have a question and we haven't been able to get to it, uh, please email us. And the email is live.events at brooker.com. Uh, if you have enjoyed watching the show and you want to see more of it, make sure to like and subscribe. And until next time, uh, make sure to keep your signal high and your background low.